Hi guys, hello, 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 and welcome to Mentorship Monday. I almost feel like we need to have a jingle uh, by now, but um, we're working on it. We're working on it. Um, I see that Sarah is here. Thank you so much for being here, friend. Um, uh, if you can just send me a request so that I can add you. Um, I see that Ngateko is here. Thank you so much for being here. Please uh, press the... Um, Asked to join the live and then we're just waiting for Sam who's going to join us as well but as our special guest join us let's give everybody a few minutes uh, just to join but thank you so very much uh, everyone and Sam is here wow everybody's here it's gonna be an absolute uh, packed packed conversation by the looks of it so let me see if I can either um, so I just need a uh, Sam let me see Sarah. I'm inviting you. Let me know if you're getting um, those invitations. Oh, I see somebody sent me a request. That is Sarah. Okay, fabulous. Uh, so Sarah's on. Hey, Doc. Hey. How are you? Hey. <laughs> are you well? Um, well? Yes, I'm well. Thank you. How are you? I'm very, very good. And Sam, hi, Sam, how are you? Hi, everyone. I'm really, really well. So excited to be awesome. here. Awesome. Which part of the country are you in, Sam? I'm in that sauna called Cape Town. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, it's a sauna in Johannesburg as well. And Sarah, you're in Maritzburg, right? Because I'm uh, at PMB, and PMB. I must say, it's actually quite chilly here this evening i was thinking of putting on a jersey before we started <laughs> oh my goodness so i wasn't expecting chills i do want to give Ankateko a chance because i know that she's here and i'm getting a message that she's unable to join so let me try and add her quickly and see anything send her an invitation oh there he is i see i've got a request from her now and let's see there she is Welcome. Hi, Thank Kateko. you. Welcome. Good evening. Hi. Hi, Nozia. Hi, hi, everyone. Hi. Good evening. Evening. So, e thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Um, it's the first Mentorship Monday that we're actually having on our mentorship, our standalone Mentorship Monday page. So, we don't know what the numbers are going to look like, but we're not doing this conversation for the numbers. I think I've really invited you because I, I personally am tired of having this conversation and I think you guys are probably going to give us some fresh insights, your own experiences, um, and I'll frame the conversation a little bit. But I'm really hoping that we're going to start making progress. And then, of course, we take these conversations and we put them on um, our YouTube um, page and a lot of views up subsequently happen after that. So I feel like whether we're talking to one woman today or to two men who might also be interested in being part of the solution, I think that's enough, right? And, okay. and, we, and we can take it from there. So let me do this. Let me go around the screen and actually just give you 30 seconds to a minute to maybe firstly just tell us who you are, but also when you saw, I don't know if you guys saw that, uh, that Economist headline, that spoke about how, you know, child um, motherhood hurts careers. What was your initial reaction and how did that make you feel inside your body? So Sarah, let me start off with you, your introduction and your reaction. Sure, thanks, Nazi. So I am Sarah Clamini. I am a 41-year-old mother of two. I have a 12-year-old and a 13-year-old. I'm also a registered pediatrician. And... Um, when I saw that uh, headline, the first thing that came to my mind was I always tell people, people often say to me, oh, being a doctor must be uh, make you a better mother. And I always say being a doctor absolutely does not make me a better mother, but being a mother definitely makes me a better doctor. Um, and that's the first thing that popped into my head, but it definitely has been a struggle and a journey and uh, a scenic one at that to get to where I am today. So I'm very excited to be able to join this conversation this evening. I, I think that's excellent. And I'm looking around for my pen because I know you guys are going to just be dropping insights that I'm going to have to be scribbling all night. Um, but thank you for that. And I think it's so beautiful uh, to hear you frame um, the value of motherhood into your career. Because again, this entire article, you know, positions 
uh, your, your, your journey as a mother as a risk to your career. And that's the kind of thing we want to get uh, to the bottom of. And then, Katako, you're a big sister to me in many ways. But to all of the people listening in, perhaps a, a quick introduction to who you are, but also when you hear the headline that motherhood is going to hurt your career, what is your immediate reaction to that? Sure, um, and uh, thank you for this platform, Nozi. And I just thought I need to be part of this conversation when you ask, you know, who wants to give a fresh, um, you know, some fresh ideas, even though I did not think of what fresh ideas will I be bringing, but I thought in the conversation, we can maybe come up with some uh, fresh ideas into this. Um, for me, it was two. It was uh, both revolt and it has always been revolt, um, but also at the same time, a reality check. So it's a very interesting combination uh, for me. And, and I'm, um, you know, I stand in in two polarities of, you know, yes, we can make it, we can climb up the ladder, um, but also at the same time, there is always reality check. One of the reality check is that I forgot to put on my earrings because my daughter was asking me about homework, you know, so, um, and yeah, and that's about that. In terms of myself, um, I am a registered psychologist in the mental health uh, space, counseling psychologist to be exact, and I am a founder of Well Life Inc. Yeah, and Katia, thank you very much. Uh, and I think we're definitely going to be tapping into your expertise as a person who's in the wellness and mental health space. Because when we're talking about uh, the burden of parenting and the, and, 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 and the weight of what it actually means to be a working mother, I don't often think we bring into the conversation how that translates into the mental space that women then have to carry um, with themselves. Sam, I'm very excited to, to meet you for the first time, I think, on this platform. But tell us a little bit about what you do and your visceral reaction uh, to that headline. Nadia, I'm really delighted to be here. It's kind of dream come true stuff. So, thank you uh, for this conversation. So, I'm 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 of the Seva Collective, and I work in the leadership transformation um, as an executive and leadership, and then deeply rooted in um, well-being programs. In, um, leadership development programs all centered on fine emotional literacy. So we run a few programs that we dig into unpacking the layers of emotions, mm -hmm. how we understand in service of leadership. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Sam. And just to just say to you, please double check your microphone. You are cutting off a little bit, but I did get the the um, the ninety percent of what you were saying. And I think it's really exciting that we have you here from a leadership and executive leadership perspective, because some of the research is telling us that, you know, there's the, there's the whole, you know, women are leaking out of the pipeline because they're having children and therefore not getting to these leadership spaces where you are playing. And so we kind of ask the question, wait, are all women or majority of women who are in these influential positions childless or bad mothers? You know, because that's kind of like, you know, what the research is telling us. So I don't want to break um, the rhythm of Mentorship Mondays because how Mentorship Mondays works is that you and I don't get to hog you guys to myself. I have a sheet of questions here that have actually come from the mentorship community that come from men and women um, who are wanting to get your thoughts on some of the questions that they've sent me. So I, I, I'm keen to get into those questions and share with them, share those questions with you. But I thought, let me just, let me just paint the canvas a little bit with some of the stats that I then went digging up after, you know, deciding that this would be a really great conversation. And as I do that, I see that a couple of people have joined and I just want to say, if you've joined, please uh, share your comments, uh, send your questions. You can do them even during the conversation now. And thank you so much for being here. I see there are a few men on the call as well. Uh, that's absolutely fantastic. And as always on Mentorship Monday, we attract, um, you know, mentors and mentees from outside of South Africa as well. So give us a shout out. If you're outside South Africa, we want to know where you are and get into it. But let me share some of the stats. I'm going to try to not 
um, get to, you know, to try and not channel my own uh, irritation too much. Um, as a fairly new mother and a person who loves her work all at the same time. But let me just hear what the stats are saying. So the first one is that it has been proven unequivocally that having children reduces your labor force participation rate. So basically, we just participate less. And part of the reasons why we do that is we start, um, we start things like, for example, uh, we go part-time, uh, we start gravitating out of particular roles that seem to suggest, uh, roles that seem to suggest that only people who can be 200% committed to the role when no other commitments um, happen. And then it says also that, I thought this was shocking, that we lose between 5 to 10% um, of wages relative to women who don't have children per child. So... Um, if you have one child, about 5 to 10%, but also it means that if you have three children, you're possibly earning less than 30% than a woman, another woman at the same age as you who doesn't have any children. I'm not even factoring in the existing gender pay gap because we don't even know how much men are earning, um, you know, relative to you who are, who's sitting with about three children. And then I thought what was also interesting because I'm like, I've heard this before, but why is it jolting to me today? And that is the fact that um, research is showing that women who have access to birth control, access to abortion or termination clinics, and ultimately the decision about when to have their children are more likely to stay in the labor force uh, than women who don't. Um, I thought that, I, I don't know why I was processing it differently today, but I heard that in a different way. I kind of almost felt like, the suggestion was to say, if you want to make it in the workplace, you got to be open to terminating. You got to be open to, you know, and, and that for me was almost sharing it in a different way. Then the last, last two things that I, uh, that I read about was the, 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 um, the fact that 44% of all um, single mothers actually live with their children. So we're still talking about working women probably in a family setting with a partner. So imagine if you're a single mother and you're working and 44% of all single mothers actually live with their children. 3.7% is men. So men who actually live with their children as single fathers. And then the balance, the missing bit in the middle is um, grandparents and other members uh, of the family. So the long and short of it is that if you're a single woman, you're more likely to be the one who's living with your child anyway. And so, you know, the other partner um, can show up on the weekends or never. Um, but essentially, parenting is your, is, is, is your job. Um, and then the last thing, which I thought was interesting, was to say that the, the earlier you have your children, so between your 20s and your 30s in your early career, that is when the parent penalty is likely to be highest, so, you, so you're going to feel it. And that is because as women get senior, Sam, and are more influential and have executive positions, they can negotiate um, better, better conditions for themselves and so can actually um, you know, have a little bit more power in what happens in their lives. So let me pause there. And that's all you're going to hear of my voice. I want to first just go around the table and just go, what do you think of that? Um, and then I want us to go into the actual questions where people are actually sending us questions about, please help. This has been my experience. Sam, let me, let me start off with you. Any of those that speak to you and resonate with you specifically? Absolutely. It's putting data to um, the systemic situation of this globe. Can you, sorry, Sam, can you move uh, closer again, please? Thank you. Um, is, is that a bit better? I think so, yes. Please go ahead. What, what is really just highlighted to me is the, the data is the systemic nature world that we live in. You know, it didn't just happen. It's been going on for um, this patriarchy. There's the systemic nature of what's happening in 
and not just the work. I think we really need to understand that this is beyond a workplace issue. In our society, it's with the culture, mm. it's the way we do things are here. Mm. That's the Renee's brand beautiful definition of, of culture. And um, you know, when we think about it, there are so many things that need to shift. And when I saw the topic and what really landed for me, me the visceral sort of um, feeling was this of what service is versus sacrifice. And I'm serving because I'm a, a wife and a mom. I want to care for my family. And, you know, it's aligned to my purpose versus when I'm sacrificed. I'm, I'm one to care for another, but in a way is depleting me. Yeah. Me. So on the service, I feel full and full and, you know, it's, high levels of satisfaction, sacrifice where I have to give up things and I'm exhausted and burnt out at the end of So for me, sure. yeah, I a very narrow perspective. So I love that. So there's a difference between, so there's maybe three things. One, it didn't just happen. So we, we need to trace back to the roots of whether it's our culture, our societies, where was this blueprint set? The second point you're making is that it's systemic. This is not a workplace problem. This is a societal problem. This is a culture challenge. But also I love the definition of the difference between service and sacrifice, because we often frame, I think, motherhood in language of sacrifice. And sacrifice actually isn't healthy because you're actually giving up um, and not, and I'm not saying there's nothing in the world that requires sacrifice, but surely we can move the con the, the pendulum more towards service uh, rather than being in that sacrificial posture because you become the sacrifice. And I think that that's the point that you're trying to land with us, Sam. Nkatego, as you heard those stats, what is what stands out for you, and what is it, you know what can you share with us around your reaction to some of those numbers that you've heard? And I'm sitting here and I'm asking myself to say, with that service and sacrifice, aren't we the ones who are making ourselves the sacrificial lamb? I, I, I'm just sitting here and wondering. Um, and I think you saw in my response to you when you suggested a particular date, and then I said, you know, on that particular day, I'm at a parents' meeting. Uh, not to say that my husband is not going to be there. He's going to be there like fully. He's attending. But I am a control freak, and I think as women, we are control freaks, and um, I want to hear because, you know, if I'm not there, I'm going to ask him what was said, and I will feel like it's a watered-down version of what was said. It's not detailed enough to satisfy my, uh, you know, need to parent a particular way. So I'm sitting here and thinking, you know, and that goes back to the whole debate of um, nature versus nurture. Um, how has nature wired us in that way to want to hover, to want to protect, to want to be in control, to want to just make sure? and and that to me might also say that because of that uh, then we were nurtured and and that's what is coming across when we say we need to look back into history and it's a century old uh, history so how that nature then came across to be nurture mm. and 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 then then questioning that nature because that nature is different today as a woman, I'm a different woman to who, whatever woman was there a thousand years ago, hundred years ago, in terms of ambition, in terms of, you know, my ideas, knowing that when I bring them across the table, they will be accepted versus shunned, my rights. And 
which then says that somewhere in the regenesis of our makeup, of our, you know, um, uh, just that, that nature might be different, but maybe we are holding on because of the nurturing. Mm. And that nurturing, I, I think somehow, somewhere, I'm sitting here and wondering if we ourselves as women are not making ourselves the sacrificial lamb. I love, I love the challenge to all of us, right? Because I do think that there is some introspection and accountability about how we perpetuate some of these, so these systemic uh, societal blueprints that Sam was talking about. And as you were just giving your example, I mean, just today, you know, my husband went out to go get groceries and the entire time I kept on thinking, but is he going to know what vanished for carpets is? Should I call? Should I, should, you know, and, and there was a special bum cream we needed for the baby. And I'm like, mm, you know, and it took, it literally took everything for me to go. He's offered, he's got the time, he's going out to do it because he's a, as a, he's a parent and he, and he acknowledges that and he's showing up as a parent. And there I am, you know, going really anxious in my head about whether he's going to get everything that's required. And that I think speaks to my own nurturing, as you say, about, well, this is actually my job and I don't think that he's going to do a good job because it's not being done by me. So I suppose the reflective question we're throwing back to all of us on the call is how much accountability and responsibility do we as women have to take um, that has led to the stereotype and this idea that if you have children, it is it is a death knell to your career. So let's reflect on that as well. I'd love to see some of your comments um, on that. Sarah, let's let's get your reaction to some of those numbers um, and what they mean for you. I mean, you're in scrubs right now, if I'm not mistaken, or you. I don't know if you're no, in scrubs. No, no, no. I, I put on a pretty top. <laughs> I mean, you put on a pretty top for us. I was expecting you in your scrubs. But tell us a little bit about what what do these numbers mean mm. for you? So I think, Nozzy, I, I just want to quickly pick up on one thing, and that is at, on the back of what uh, what was just said. To me, one of the revelations that I've had, you know, the last four years have been very intense for, for my family. I've been through the process of specializing, writing massive board exams, working full time with overtime, at the same time doing a research master's, all in service of, of, of wanting to specialize in pediatrics. And so it's been a really, really tough and, and draining time for my family. And and one thing that just stood out for me in the last little while is that idea of the, the mental load of mothering, which is kind of what we were just talking about. And and to me, the mental load of, of mothering has been described as, you know, you're the one who sees that there's no um, bread left and you have to get bread to make sure there's bread for school, school lunches. Or, you know, you're the one that has to remember that uh, this one needs to be be picked up at that time or this teacher needs to be contacted for that thing and the journey that we've been on as a family and i'm very fortunate to have an extremely supportive partner the journey that we've been on is is shifting that mental load mm. is saying that physically i just could not be that parent I, yeah. I actually just could not and so not only did my husband take over doing the shopping he actually took over setting up the shopping list and the first few times he went shopping, yes, he was like, please, can you help me with the shopping list? But actually, now when I go shopping, I ask him, what kind of buster must I get? Yeah. <laughs> and so I definitely agree that there, there is a certain element where we as women have to say, how much is society asking us to sacrifice? How much is, are our children asking us to sacrifice? And how much are we forcing ourselves to sacrifice, which is actually not required? Yeah. And the one that is a, that is a non-negotiable for me, for me is my children. So if it is something that my children genuinely need me for, then that has to be priority. I, I have refused point blank to allow, as, as much as it was within my power, to allow my children to be amp impacted by my own journey. I want them to get the best of me. I don't yeah. want them to get leftovers from mum's career. Mom's career. But at the same time, I think there definitely is a role for us um, to actually ask ourselves, who's asking me to sacrifice this? Do I really need to? 
Um, and, and I think that leads me on nicely to what I wanted to comment on from the stats. What really stood out for me and is just such a burden on my heart, and that is the plight of single mothers. Mm. Because I think that, you know, we all are fortunate from what I've picked up. I mean, I know you, Nozzy, but from the other two panelists, we are fortunate to be in loving, committed relationships with husbands who are supportive, who are willing to play out of position, so to speak, and, and take on roles that society wouldn't expect them to. Um, but what about those mothers? And, you know, you were talking about women who, who you know, children who live with their single mothers versus those mothers who then have to ship the children off to yeah. other relatives yeah. so that they can can still um, contribute to, to the economy and provide for their children. And I mean, my own husband was the, the, the son of a single mother and he himself was shipped off to relatives so that his mother could work and contribute and, 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 and I've seen the strain that it placed on his relationship with her. Yeah. Um, and and on her view of herself as a mother, yeah. you know, and so that is a that to me is is such a real um, real and deep concern, um, and uh, and 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 it also goes in with the other thing that really stuck out to me was the ability when you are older, the ability to to be able to to um, master your own destiny and manage yeah. your own time. Um, and so, and I was just thinking to myself, what role do we as women have to make space, to hold space for younger mothers and for single mothers? Um, and that, that is a challenge to us, to, to make space and hold space for those women. Sure. I think you've said it um, so well. And, you know, one of the things that they had not connected, the dots had not connected for me until you just said it now, was... The, the the whole um, phenomena of women leaving their children at home, that actually it's trying to reduce the, it actually is trying to reduce the parent, the parent penalty as a single mother mm -hmm. so that you can still stay economically active. And what we haven't counted in and factored in is the emotional toll and it, the, the consequences on what that does on the mother-child relationship in the long term. Um, but I also wanted to just share something as you were talking about the mental load about, you know, not even having to come up with the list of groceries. There's a really interesting, I think it's called, I'll call it a documentary. It's called Fair Play um, that my husband and I watched. And it was, this, it, it was exactly about this idea of the mental burden uh, that we women carry about having to know all about the details. And one of the exercises that they actually encourage you to do with your partner is for you to sit down individually at first to actually write down the list of all the jobs you actually do, mm. including the jobs that take less than two minutes. Mm. But actually when those two minutes accumulate, for yep. example, you having to know that you must, you're the one who must pack the sunscreen because when you arrived, you know, partner turns to you and says, where's the sunscreen? It's like, it's a given that, Surely you would have known to pack the sunscreen and you go, well, is that my job? And so, so one of the things that was really interesting about it is that once you go through putting that list and tabulating that list individually, it's a, it can be a really good conversation starter to reveal in your own partnership, in your marriage, in your relationship, um, who actually is carrying the burden of being a parent more than the other. And I think the beauty of it is then, how do you then recalibrate and actually hand over some jobs mm. and just say, actually, actually, I, I'm actually not good at this job. I don't mm. like this job. It doesn't make me feel good. I don't actually want to be the one to do it. I don't have the capacity to do this job. And maybe you're better at doing that job. And mm. I just found that really helpful. So fair play for anyone. I'm giving them a big shout out now. Um, I think you can mm. look it up on YouTube and you might actually find it there. So let me get to some of the questions. Um, so there's a question from Anati. Anati is saying, what advice do you guys have for young professionals who actually want to become parents and want to advance their careers at the same time? And I think it gets to the essence of this conversation. So Anati, from what I'm reading, is a young professional, not yet a parent, but wants to be a parent. And basically she's asking what advice might you have 
for me to minimize the parent penalty on my life as much as possible. Nkateko, let me kick off with you first. Yeah. Um, I remember there was a statement that Oprah Winfrey said, it was many years ago, I think it could be about 12 or so years ago. She said, women can have it all, but not all at the same time. I got so, so angry hearing that statement. Um, I was like, you know, how can she, you know, uh, she, she's liberal and how can she? And it's only much later that I got to understand that statement. And, and, and it was to say, there's no limits to what we can achieve, but, um, and maybe coming back to my statement of, we need to be realistic about, there is a time where you are pregnant, heavily pregnant. There were things that you were able to do when you are not heavily pregnant that you can do um you know when when you are and that becomes reality i was with a client i think it was um last week thursday or so and she said after pregnancy my eyesight started declining and she was actually making a case study about a colleague's child whose eyesight is almost diminished as a result of the second pregnancy so and i i listened to that with keenness to be like geez if your eyesight i mean and i know Nuzi, you also have glasses <laughs> you know and you need your eyesight to to read uh, for a long time you know to prepare to be in front of audience to engage meaningfully and i you know i know of my sisters uh, you know we all cracked some tooth because of calcium deficiency during pregnancy even though we had a lot of supplements and you can imagine with a cracked tooth and now you have to go fix it you have a presentation the next day but you can't be smiling and be as confident as you need to be so to um the person who is asking the question i'm a young professional i want to be a parent i want to climb up the ladder i think just think through for you, which one do you want to prioritize at which stage of your life? As we mentioned that, you know, um, women who have children much later on, uh, you know, they will have had their, I, I would say close to halfway their career tra trajectory, um, you know, projected and, and met somewhat and therefore they've got more leeway to negotiate their flexibility their pegs and all of that so so just time when you want to start a family a, and we know for women there's a biological clock issue but fortunately medicine has also advanced to help us to have children at a much later stage i'm not necessarily encouraging that women should have uh, children at a much later stage it will depend on what are your goals what are your career goals and what are your family goals so i, I must say that you've reminded me i got a peek of my um my doctor's for my file at the hospital when i was pregnant because i would be classified as uh yeah sarah you guys are to blame for this i would be classified <laughs> as an old mother i was mm. 39 uh mm. when i had my son and i saw that they called me a geriatric patient mm. uh i mean at at the age of 39 that's what they call you that you are geriatric but i think and sam i'm coming to you next but i think it's you know you're raising something so hard for us to grapple with Nkateko because on the one hand it's to say you know what the workplace is the workplace and if you're going to make it have your children uh later uh and there might be women going but no I want to grow up with my children mm. I want to have my children in my 20s and I'm I want to run around with them and so on and so forth and I I I mean I must say personally and I'm not saying this is based on anything this is my personal experience having children later probably was one of the best decisions i think i made for myself simply because i'm so career driven and i think if i wasn't maybe if i had if i was more family orientated maybe i wouldn't feel that way but in hindsight i i i i'm so glad that that's how it worked out my husband always laughs when i tell him because i i was um so upset at him that he wasn't proposing and he's like see you needed another year and maybe another year would have been better. But I think you raise an important question. So, Sam, there's a question from Lulo. 
And Lulu is saying, guys, I hear all of this, but what is the role of employers in changing the workplace so that it does not actually become the, the arena of, of where such penalties are incurred by women? Can we change anything about the workplace? Or have we given up and agreed that work, work is designed around the archetype of a man and is you know, designed for men and their progression and women become the sacrificial lambs on the way to the top? How, what can we change at work? Short answer is we need more women at the seat of the table in senior board level roles. Absolutely. When the world and businesses with men don't bring a woman's um, perspective, her quality, her intuition. There are all sorts of other energies that get left. So voice is in the conversation, and we need women to be in those conversations, men to decide what our future looks mm. like. Mm. Yeah, I, I actually, I mean, I really like that. And one of the things I always talk about, so I do a bit of training for women who sit on boards, and I always talk about um, this idea of substance over form. So I didn't study accounting, but I do know this one thing from uh, the world of accounting called substance over form. And this idea that your substance needs to be greater than your form. Your form is the fact that you're a woman, but your substance needs to be the things that you use in your voice to talk about. Because far too often we then, you know, there's imposter syndrome, there's all of these other voices. So you have a seat at the table, they've invited you, but you're not part of raising the question um, that changes the lived experience of the workplace for women. And, and, and so Sarah, I want, to, I want to come to you. There's a question from Makole that I'd love for you to speak about because Makole is saying, um, part of the problem it seems is the emotional toll that the parent penalty takes on women. And I want your specific comment on the judgment that we are subjected to as women. And I'll give you an example from my own, my own lived experience. Um, I have this idea that when I had a baby I was going to take six months off and you know I was going to be at home and I was going to you know chill my baby was seven weeks and I was on, on an airplane to Geneva to go and moderate a conference that I really wanted to be a part of um, in, in Switzerland and I could feel the unspoken judgment around those especially close to me with the exception of my husband who were just saying, that is bad mother. Mm. Like, like, are you seriously going to leave a seven week old baby and go and, and, and go and do your work? So I'd love for you to talk about the emotional talk, but also how do we tune out the, the, the voices of judgment that are bound to arise because of what Nkateko talks about, which is nature versus nurturing and how we've been nurtured to believe that we can only show up in particular ways and what being a good mother actually looks like. I think that's, it's such an important and key thing. And I think, you know, the reality is that I, I also myself faced, faced similar uh, a judgment, but from the other way. And the truth is that as a woman, as a mother, if you'll excuse my friends, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. I mean, I, I literally had someone telling me that my problem was I loved money too much. And I should just give up my job and stay at home with my babies and just live off whatever my husband could earn. Um, and I th think I think that the first thing is we as women, we have to take control of this conversation mm -hmm. and season it with grace. Mm -hmm. Because if you choose to stay at home with your child and to not go to work, good for you. If you choose to get on a plane and to fly to Geneva, and I saw your Instagram posts and I was like, wow. <laughs> But if that's what is right for you and your family, who am I? Who yeah. am I to comment on that? The only person that we should allow to make any reasonable comment on how we, what decisions we make, is our partner if they are loving and involved, 
and our children themselves. Yeah. And actually, that, that is it. I mean, I was also, I was raised a latchkey kid. My mom worked full time, got home late, etc. And I remember working through with my psychologist this idea of the good enough mother. And my psychologist, she, she kept asking me questions again and again and again. And eventually I got this thing to act to this thing of access. My children need to have access to me. And whether your baby is six months old or 13 years old, that's what we as mothers owe our children is access. Mm. And if they have access to us, then if we send dad to the parent teacher conference meeting, because actually it's good for him to get the information firsthand because he doesn't listen when I tell him. Or if I, you know, if I choose to go, as long as at the end of the day, my children have access and access to the best of me, not the leftovers. Sure. Um, and I, I love think, that. Go ahead. And I think that we need to be kinder to each other and we need to be kinder to ourselves when it comes to this that actually we spend a lot of time doubting our own decisions i spent so much time doubting myself when i was in, in this last four years when i was in this absolute treadmill trying to get my my specialization done and at the end of it when i when i got my results and i was celebrating with my family with my kids and my parents i said to my husband and, you know, we, we made it. And, mm -hmm. and I think our marriage is pretty much intact. And he said, no, definitely. And I said, you know what? I think the kids are okay. And my daughter stopped me. She said, you know, mommy, I'm more than okay. Sure. Because in the last four years, you have taught me that if I want something, I must go for it. And if nothing should hold me back. Nothing should make me doubt myself. And so actually, I spent so many of the last four years so stressed out that I was ruining my children, that I was, you know, being the worst that mother ever. Did. But actually, I was, I, was doing, I was doing well by them. I was doing right by them because of what I was modeling in my own life, you know. And so I think when it comes to dealing with the emotional load of making those decisions, I think we need to be kinder to ourselves and we need to be kinder to each other. And we need to take hold of this conversation and season it with grace. Because for sure. too long, mothers have come under judgment by everyone whose mm -hmm. voice actually really shouldn't matter when it comes to these issues. Sure, I think that's so really powerful because I think if we take a step back and just ask ourselves the question, what am I modeling in this moment? Mm -hmm. um, that's yeah. where we open the door and invite grace mm -hmm. in. Because we're not then, you know, feeling on the basis of what do people think? Because that's the wrong question, right? Absolutely. What does everybody think? Mm -hmm. But it's more, what am I modeling in this moment? And if I'm modeling hard work, if I'm modeling um, going after your goals, if I'm modeling, I think you make such a profound point. I also love the point mm -hmm. about access. I've never actually thought about that, that it's actually a question of access and, and, and being able to reach out and feel and touch and talk to mom when I feel that I need her uh, at the same time. There's, um, I want to get to this question from Paul. Paul's a man, Mkateko. Um, and Paul is saying, but what can we as men do? And he's saying, I want to know what I can do at home, but I also want to know what I can do at work. Um, because I feel like that might be the one of the building blocks we need to have right to really reconstruct the workplace experience for women yeah. because i think when we talk allyship at work i feel like it can be so fluffy sometimes you know so much there in the air and this is why i love and pause question which is tell me give me some guidance on what can i do at work at home for my wife uh, and in the, and my children to really reduce the parent burden but also, what can I do at work for my women colleagues to try and reduce the parent burden on them? What would be some of the go-to things you would say, Tumpo? Yeah, I think it's asking. Um, women have a difficulty in asking for help, um, you know, contrary to, to, to belief. And I will even say a, a, a side story. I think our daughter was about three months or so. And I'm home, I've been home for my maternity leave uh, during the day. And as I mentioned, my husband is the most hands-on 
father and husband as you can have them you know the other day uh, made an example at a seminar on friday morning he took out a vacuum cleaner i was busy with lunch boxes and he took out a vacuum cleaner and started vacuuming at 7 a.m so that's how much hands-on he is and so he comes back from work i'm on maternity leave as i mentioned i love cooking and i'm the one who is responsible for cooking in our household and he comes and he lays on the couch and that that's unlike him so he sits on the couch so i'm irritated you know i've got a young baby with me on the arm and then then you know the cupboards you can hear that there's something there and then then he stands up to do something something that was not related to him hearing the cupboards uh closing the way that they were and he says is there anything wrong and i'm kind of looking at him like can't you see uh so so but and then he says ask and I was like, is, that, is it that simple? Like, I should have just asked, you know, yeah. didn't you see? Couldn't you read? So um, so ask your, your wife, uh, your partner, uh, the mother of your kids, what do they need from you? And um, what is it that they can trust you with? Uh, so also with the same, I can't trust him with cooking. Um, I, I said to him the other time, also maternity leave, another maternity leave. I said to him, I've not been able to cook. Uh, can you boil some water and put spaghetti in the pot after boiling water? After 30 minutes, I come downstairs. The spaghetti is in the boiling water on the countertop. So you, you, you yeah. So, so, so ask um, specifically to say, what do you trust me with? Because it does not help to give or hand over control the control that we have with things that we are um, feeling like this person cannot be trusted uh, i will have to do it again so that does not help so be very specific about the asking and what do you trust me with so sometimes you can be trusted with driving the child around or just taking the child to the park so that mommy can just have two hours Yes. of solid sleep non-interrupted two hours of solid sleep while you are just driving you are good at driving you just put the child on the car seat and that can be good enough uh, with the co-workers i think having the grace um that you know we're just speaking about earlier on when a colleague is saying and you know you know people who are genuine you know people who are not genuine so i mean if the person has been performing okay they were you know um not clumsy with their work they are professional and when you hear them saying you know what i need a break maybe to go and pump uh you know for the child um i need to be alone for maybe 30 minutes so that i can get in the zone because pumping while you are stressed you know and getting 10 millimeters out of the the breast can be one of the most stressful things so even designing those private um rooms other than women pumping in toy in bathrooms but having a specific room for a woman to be able to you know uh, physically feel like they are safe and they are not in this uh, unhygienic environment especially for open plan um offices so we can then provide something like that especially if you are in a managerial uh, position and and even you know do you need extra time maybe to come a bit later and leave a little bit earlier or you know come a little bit later and then leave a little bit so that flexibility as long as you know the person does their work and offering work from home i think that is a superpower that we can provide women yes working from home is a scam i believe that but for a young for for a, a mother of a young child or a family of a young child um working from home can actually be quite ideal or even yourself as a partner to ask to work from home so that you can be with your spouse even though you are not on paternity leave so i actually love that i want to read some of the comments uh, but thank you so much for the ask comment, because I think that's something I needed to work through because I didn't want to ask. Mm. And so Fair Play, that movie was so good for me because I also realized he can't read my mind. Mm. He can't, he, you know, and because also because of the nature and nurture, there's certain things he just doesn't know, you know. Uh, and so I have to ask and actually part, the asking is part of teaching each other in the same way that I, you know he asked if there's something he doesn't but i don't know why it was just such a blockage because i was like 
surely you must get this you know why do i have to ask and that's not and i think not because because of how we operate as women you know when we have a, a party or whatever as women we move from one space and then when we see somebody standing up to go wash dishes we go and stand with them and for men that is not the same and that is why we had to we have to break that barrier and when you said that it was really three years into our marriage mm. i was like oh i i need to do that and it was foreign to me because i you know i come from a, a family of women and sisters and all of that so we automatically do that and mm. and so that is very key um in being able to negotiate mm. and and, and and not seeing that as you being a, a again a sacrifice and yeah. knowing that you have that right to be able to ask so there's a theme that keeps coming up and it's a theme of lactating and breastfeeding so mm -hmm. there are there's um enati says uh can the workplace support lactating mothers please actually it's a human right uh Flatter says there are quite a number of resources available uh, online for managers and on how and and how these can be implemented. I like that. Let's say maybe you can just um, mention some of them so others can maybe look up those resources for themselves. Um, there's also let's say also made the comment that I pinned to say um, workspaces must support resources such as lactation rooms, child friendly play areas, and family family uh, family friendly work arrangements, uh, which I absolutely love. But there's just um, there's a lot of commentary, Sam, if I can come to you with this, around an easy, low-hanging fruit is just to ask the question, have we accommodated the breastfeeding mother and their need for privacy, but also to Ngateka's point, then as you said, we actually need to get into a different zone to be able to pump uh, and to fulfill that functional responsibility that we have as women as well where would you point us Sam in terms of resources to go to easy things to do that we can implement and push to implement for those of us who are in leadership positions um, sadly to say in my 30, 30 years of being in corporate I've not seen one corporate environment that a place for women to um, um, sort of pump milk. And I think it goes back to what panelists was we've got to ask for what we need um, mm. in order for those to become part of the well being um, resources that are offered. There is spend in well being in the workplace, and well being is a no brainer because that's what really fosters belonging. You know, knowing that I can be my whole self um, in the workplace. The other thing that I just want to land in here is that often um, leaders themselves leadership roles purely based on transactional skills. So they were really good at being an exec, and now they're the sales director. Um, they were really good at um, hearing role, and now they lead a team of engineers that doesn't make you a good leader of people um so work in for leaders to do to complete our self-awareness firstly for themselves the outside in because if they're not aware of how they operate they're really not going to be able to create capacity for us for the people that, that they lead they're able to tune in where their people are at, what they need. There's a big component in the leadership development and in that this transactional stuff. It really is a stand and we take care of people rather than just telling them um, what to do. Yeah taking care of people beyond the transactional mm -hmm. skill, mm -hmm. uh, but understanding the, what, the responsibility of leading people and managing people and what that actually means. Um, I, I'm mindful of the fact that we're running out of time. We've got six minutes left. Uh, Satsai, thank you so much for posting in the chat a resource on what gender inclusive practices in the workplace might actually look like. Um, and that comes from the UN, Web, UN Women 
uh, website. So I think that's really great for those of you who are going, you know, what are the things that should be asking for at work? And so, you know, as you were saying that, Sam, about, you know, asking for what we need, I was like, the next time they start discussing a golf day, mm-hmm. is this is not the part, the part where we go, hi, we still don't have a lactation room, you know, mm-hmm. but it's about not being afraid to to raise that. And I mean, I love the fact that I think it was Enat who was saying, guys, this is a basic human right. Mm-hmm. And if we think about the workplaces we step into, how much of that is just missed um, and how workplaces are just um, blind to that. I want to talk in the last sort of uh, two to three minutes about maternity leave. Um, because one of the things I think where the rubber hits the road and we're having to make the trade off is how much maternity leave we actually take. And the inherent fear that if I take leave for too long, they're going to get somebody else. Um, I'm going to be overlooked for the next position. So much so, I remember there was research that had come out a few years ago that says when an executive search firm is looking to make a decision about whether to hire a woman in an executive role or not, they ask the question whether this woman has had her children or not. Mm because they're not looking for somebody who's then going to take six months off because they've just had a child. Now, I think this could be an entire whole conversation, Mm. but one of the things that I'm really passionate about and what I spoke about when I came back from maternity was to stop framing it like time lost. And I kept on saying to people and people like, oh, where have you been? Uh, we haven't seen you, mind you, we haven't seen you for seven weeks and a month, basically. And I'd come back and say, I was expanding the human race. Um, and that was just, just kind of like my standard answer. But maybe, um, Sarah, you can just share with us, how, how do we begin to trust our, our own gut and our own voices a little bit better, especially around those critical decisions where we've taken the decision to become a mother, and now we've got to follow it through by normalizing the fact that this is what women do because we have wombs. Mm-hmm. I think it's such a, a key question. And I think it really is the place where this issue starts. Mm-hmm. And a lot of women make the decision to not go back mm-hmm. after that maternity leave because of what needs they perceive their children to have in that time. And the reality is that there's a lot of research around the first thousand days of a baby's life. Mm-hmm. Um, and and how key they are to to long term development. And when I say long term, I mean even into adulthood. Um, and there's nutritional and developmental support that a mother needs to provide in that time. And so I think that I love what you said about how you you know you 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 want to take it back from saying it's time lost. Yeah. And I think I think what we need to try and do is work out. If I choose, and again, going back to what I was saying about allowing people to make the decision that's right for them and their family. But if I choose to stay at home for four months or six weeks or six months, how do I claim that time as actually vital for myself, for my own growth and for my child? Because actually that's, that is, I think, the key. I mean, there's, there's skills that you learn in that time as a mother. Going back to my first comment, about how being a mother definitely makes me a better doctor. And there are skills that you learn as a mother. There's a, there's a part of you that's unlocked, that intuition. That's when that's unlocked, when it's just you and baby crying for hours on end and you work out, oh, this is why they're crying. You know, There's parts of yourself as a woman that are unlocked by having that, that close one-on-one time with, with baby. So I think for me, that's actually the key, is, is saying this is not time lost. Any time that you choose to be at home with your baby, whatever is right for you, but that is not time lost. So we've got one minute left, so 60 seconds, so you all get 20 seconds each. And in the 20 seconds, I want one statement that you would love to gift to working mothers today. A word of encouragement, um, anything that you want to leave them with um, after listening to this conversation. It can be a mentorship insight, whatever that you feel like you know, if there's one thing I can say to working women right now, or working mother rather, is 
this is the thing that I would give to you as a mentorship insight. So Sam, let me go with you first. What's the one thing you would like to share with working mothers today? I would say just continue to develop and drive self-awareness so that you pivot from a place of clarity where you've made meaning of your life and your decisions, a pivot from a place of clarity and true choice. Mm. Mm, I love that clarity and true choice. Um, Nkateko, your one, your one mentorship insight that you'd share with working moms today. You're good, good enough, um, and I think rise to the consequences of your choices. So those are the choices that you have made. They were not made by anyone, not the society. So rise to the consequences of those choices and you are good enough, be it that you choose to be uh, like me who sometimes come back at eight uh, or nine, um, you know, so you are good enough. Whatever input that you have in your children and the best interest at heart that you have for your children, you're good enough. I love that. Rise to the consequences of your choices. I even go as far as saying rise to the joy of your choices. Mm. But sometimes mm -hmm. I feel like consequences can be such a hard word, but it's the joy of the choice, the joy of working and of being a mother and being a partner. So thank you very much for that. Sarah, you get to take us home. What's the one word you would leave, a mentorship insight you'd leave for working mothers on the call today? Not just you can do it, you are doing it. Mm -hmm. Try to shift your vision from the lack to the mm -hmm. presence. Mm -hmm. And be, mm -hmm. bear in mind that each minute, each small conversation, each hug, each cuddle, you are doing it and you are a gift mm -hmm. to your children. I absolutely love that. You are doing it and you are a gift to your children. Let me first start saying you uh, have been all a gift to all of us today. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Kateko. Thank you, Sam. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your insights. Thank you for the time away from your families and your children uh, or your husbands or just from yourself. You could have, you know, done anything with this time. And thank you for, for, for progressing the conversation. I really feel like Yes, this is a conversation that needs a whole lot more than just an hour. But I think when we bring in our lived experiences with our expertise, that combination of experience and expertise um, in, through the voice of women can really be powerful. Um, I learned so much uh, from all of you today. Uh, things, dot connects that I hadn't made, things that suddenly started making sense. And I really hope that everyone who's watching now is on the live now and those who are going to be consuming this on the YouTube channel afterwards that you find this useful. I also want to do a special shout out to the guys and all the men who join, the men who send questions, uh, looking for ways to be a part of the solution to reduce that parent burden, to be better parents themselves. I think that's, uh, um, that's why we're here and thank you very much. So let me close with Klatze who says, another important conversation is one around the continuity burden of unpaid care for women. And this includes of course, the care for elderly parents, children and special needs clutter absolutely and we're definitely going to talk about um as what i call the care economy and the fact that women take no wages in that care economy and we keep going back to the altar of being that sacrificial lamb over and over again good night and thank you very very much thank i hope so you guys thank you. thank you thank you thank you for having us and so bye bye